Anytime, mister. All right. Well, start off. Start off by saying good afternoon to everyone here, and congratulations for everyone that's receiving an award tonight. A uh, special shout out to Mr. West and Ms. Rosa, who are here sitting right in front of me. And um, our choir recently took a tour of California, just traveling and singing all across the state. And they just got back last night, and from what I heard, it was just lots of fun. They got to see a lot of places. Um, I remember I saw pictures of um, the Capitol building in Sacramento, the Golden Gate Bridge. They stopped in a few, um, at a church, I believe. They sang in there, and I heard it was just wonders to see all across California the beauty we have here. And our spring sports, uh, they kicked off a while back. And baseball is 4-3 and three out of league and 1-0 in league. And they are actually against Patriots this Friday at our home at 315. So if you want to see some cross-town rivalry, feel free to stop by. And our sophomore, our Lady Jacks, are also 3-5 out of league and 0-1 in league. And they also play Patriot on Friday at 315, but that's here at Patriot. Our swim uh, for boys, 1-0 in league, and girls are 0-1. They're away at Bull Valve this Thursday at 3.15. Our golf is 4-0 in not, not in league, and our boys tennis 4-0 in non-league. And today, they actually began league against Verona. Um, more details on that next meeting. And they are the runner-up chance for, at the Etiwanda tournament, so congrats to them. And our track also took on La Sierra last week. Uh, the boys and girls are both 0-1, unfortunately. La Sierra is a huge team. We're outnumbered. Um, they are away at Verona Valley High School this Thursday as well. Our ASB elections are coming up this week, Thursday and Friday are elections, so next board meeting I'll have to report my replacement. So uh, feel free to, uh, to get some on that. And our pep rally is the week right after spring break, which is eight, um, April 5th. And our spirit week kicks off April 1st through April 5th. Monday, April 1st is Jack Spirit Day. Everyone just wear their Jack Spirit. Show some Root Valley pride. Tuesday is April 2nd. is T-Ball Tuesday. Everyone wear their, be their baseball t-shirts. Um, of course, not the actual team shirts or just any baseball team. We like baseball teams. And Wednesday is Gender Bender Day, which is guys just as girls, and that's always interesting to watch um, the different takes on everyone. And that Thursday is Grease Lightning. And everyone is dressing up as greasers, and that Friday, the day of the pep rally, is Mr. vs. Mrs. or T. vs. Speed Lady. And the reason that Friday is that day is because our theme, our pep rally is themed as a greaser thing. T. Birds vs. Speed Ladies. So that's going to be an exciting rally for everyone. Uh, our prom location has been decided, and it will be at the Fox Theater in Redlands. Tickets are on sale now until the, the night of prom, which is April 26th. And as news from the Career Center, our college acceptance, flag, acceptance flags are going up. We have about six to ten seniors that have already decided, decided which um, college they, have, they want to go to. And they already have their flags posted outside the Career Center to, to um, congratulate them on making their decision. But worry not, there will be tons of flags coming up in the next few weeks as people make their admissions decisions. And last but not least, I'd like to mention our WASP visit, which is actually going on right now up until, I believe, Wednesday. So well, I, went, I met the WASP committee yesterday, and they seem like really great people, and I look forward to seeing them in the next few days. I actually talked, I spoke with them today uh, during our ASB period, and they have really great questions, and we gave them even better answers. <laughs> We're hot. So we hope for the best hearing from them, and hopefully we get that six-year accreditation. And the construction and the beautification of our school has been, it's going on right now. Um, we appreciate all the new paint being installed, the windows, all, it looks, our campus looks really great now. Well, it looked great before, but now it looks even better. And thank you very much. And Roger speaks the truth. The accreditation team was very, very positive about the ASB, which has always been a strength of the school when you guys did an exceptional job. I followed them on the tour, and they, they knew the school inside out, so thank you. Um, Kat, now would you like to tell us about your deal? I'll try. Okay, well, my name is Kat Rivas, and I am this year's AP president, and this is my first time, so be merciful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have the Woman Wonder Writers, with this, which is a youth art expedition with the winners from Rubido are Lisa Gonzalez, Carla Mejia, Yaya Sanchez, and Monica Rivas. 
Lisa, Carla, and Yaya have their self-authentication projects displayed as well as their group empathy project on bullying child abuse display. Monica helped create the group empathy project last year on sex trafficking awareness that is displayed as well. The exhibit is on March 7th and starts at 6 downtown on Lemon Street and University Avenue. The girls will be there showing off their work too. And for our science fair results, 8 out of 10 entries placed. For first place, Catherine Gomez and Jessica Gonzalez, the environmental science, will move on to Brent. In second place, Jessica Lemus and Bernice Lopez, Gabriel Maldonado and Marissa Roldan with their microbiology and zoology project. Tony Sykes with chemistry and physics. Hugo Anacleto, Veridiana Rico, and Abraham Serrano with behavioral sciences, also qualified to move to RIMS. In third place, Alondra Navarrete, Evelyn Benitez, and Alicia Patino, they with their microbiology and zoology project. Edward Savant Eduardo Cervantes and Joel Gonzalez and with their applied of mechanics. Kayla Hoare Lee and her project with chemistry and physics. And here at RHS, we're really big on our sports. And we're really proud to announce that this year, both our girls and boys soccer teams have advanced to CIF. Um, the boys advanced to the second round of playoffs with a 7-0 win. And they advanced to the quarterfinals against Carter High School and lost 2-1. And for the girls' soccer, we qualify for the playoffs for the first time in seven years. And we won our first playoff game, 4-3, and it was the first playoff victory in 10 years. So we're really proud to step up in the programs. Um, we traveled to St. Bonaventure, which is in Ventura, so it was a very long drive, in a big charter bus. And it was comfortable, but very, very long, about three hours, um, and we lost one to zero. But it was a great season for us, and we're really proud to take that next step for girls soccer. Um, okay, so Falcon Pride Day was a big success. It was on February 13th, and we had over 400 eighth graders on campus, campus that ate their lunch here and went to an assembly, and they got a tour of the campus and rotated to nine different academic programs that are offered here. And a lot of those students don't look like they're meant to be in high school. Honestly, they're very small students, but you know, <laughs> they'll work. <laughs> um, okay, so RHS is going to be hosting a community health fair called We Connect on Saturday, March 2nd. They provided free health services, tax prep, and groceries to the community. Our volunteers were praised by the organizers as the best they have ever had. RHS is also implementing a new positive behavior intervention support by giving students a ticket when they demonstrate one of our Esslers, which are seekers, outstanding citizens, achievers, and responsible individuals. So S-O-A-R, SOAR. And we use that as SOAR with pride, you know, Falcon. Um, that enters them into a weekly drawing for 20 winners to get a free movie ticket and then a larger prize each month. I actually received one of those prizes for outstanding citizens about last week. I found like $10 on the ground, and I don't know who it was, and I told a, um, a supervisor, and he gave it to me because I gave it back to the girl. I didn't know who it was, and I found the girl. I gave her back her $10, so that was really nice. <laughs> okay, so we held the KC boot camp this past Saturday morning as an intervention for the students to voluntarily come in and work on their English and math skills in preparation for the upcoming Casey test. We had 131 students come for English and 100 students come for math. We will be having more, actually this is in the past, but we had three other Casey workshops and we had a lot of students coming. Um, everyone wore purple to support the 10th graders on the week they had the Casey, so everybody was supporting our sophomores. Um, and this week we actually have the KC at about 97% participation, and now we're just waiting for the results. Um, I want to congratulate Ms. Cavalloni because she received the Bob Burton Spirit Award for Outstanding School Spirit from the Cal California Activity Directors Association. And that was really an honor for Ms. Cavalloni with only being ASB um, advisor for, this is her third year, and she received an award, so that was really an honor for us to hear. 
Um, and I'm very pleased to announce that our science teacher, Ms. Gatoski, is representing us tonight as Teacher of the Year. And this year's prom is actually April 26th, and our theme will be Once Upon a Time, one of Once Upon a Time, excuse me. Um, and it will be held at the Riverside Municipal Auditorium. And it's gonna be beautiful. Um, I guess they remodeled the Riverside Auditorium and it's beautiful. They're, we're gonna have live music at the bottom. Um, the dance floor is huge and we're gonna have SOS Entertainment um, there to DJ the dance. And there will be a caricature artist with flip books. So they're gonna be making flip books. And I believe the prices start at $50. So, April 26th, anybody want guest passes? <laughs> Just um, okay, so this year's API goal is 735 for us. Um, our activities are trying to encourage the students to soar and rise up. So our theme this year is actually up, like the movie. So it was um, a really creative idea from our leadership class. And right now, um, unfortunately, because our gym is being remodeled, we will not be having an API rally. But we have been making huge posters with Russell and Carl, the little old man. And we're trying to encourage the students to keep trying and never give up and to keep fighting for that API score. And we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, next up, we have Best of Rubido that's coming up. It's going to be April 25th. And it's going to include the art walk, carnival games, jumpers, and a free community spaghetti feed. So anybody who comes, please, you are very welcome. You will get free food, and there will be lots and lots of carnival games where you guys can play and bring kids for some candy. Um, our spring sports rally has actually been moved back due to the gym being remodeled. And we are having this rally as a senior send-off rally. So sending the seniors off into their new lives. And our theme is going to be a 60s beach theme. And it's going to be featuring beach boys. So we'll see how that beach theme goes. And that's it. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. And I, I just want to say, aren't these three outstanding examples of the public education that the teachers in this room provide. So a hand for you and a hand for them. Thank you ladies and gentlemen. And we have one item to, we have several items to report out from closed session. This is Elsa. Thank you. The first item that we want to report out is the board voted by a 5-0 vote to accept the retirement of Paul Gill, our Assistant Superintendent of Business Services. Now, that will be effective August 1st, 2013, and we just wanted to tell you, Paul, how much we have enjoyed every day working with you. Um, I wish you all the very best. I wanted to vote no. The board voted by a 5-0 vote in closed session to appoint Paula Ford as the new Assistant Superintendent of Business Services, effective June 1st, 2013. Paula, if you would stand. And now what we've all gathered here to recognize the site and district teachers of the year. And at this time, I'd like to ask the board to meet me down front and we'll get the show on the road.
Are we all here? Well, first of all, I just want to say, this. I love this crowd. You know, Sometimes we walk into the boardroom and there's a crowd and we're not sure why. But <laughs> that always is a little trouble. But this crowd is fantastic and I wish we could do this every day. I just love this meeting. And I just want to say what what you all do every single day is really, I, I know people always say this and it sounds like lip service, but none of us who aren't in the classroom would be here if you weren't in the classroom. And what you do is so important for our kids and our community. And I just want to mention, like Julie Rose, that she was recognized the other night with the Crystal Apple Award. We have. I think it's a wooden apple tonight, no crystal, but it's, <laughs> but um, it's, just, I'm just so proud always of the district and the quality of teaching that happens in classroom after classroom after classroom. And I know you all represent the best, but the ones that work with you are just, um, well, I don't want to diminish your words, but they're all really talented too. And so it's just, it's just been really neat to see you all here and your families and support groups and cheering sections and everybody else is here. So with that, I'll quit talking and get on with recognizing people. So we start, we do this in alphabetical order, right? High school, elementary, middle, and high, alphabetical. So we start with Camino. So Camino Real is delighted to present Ms. Garnet Peralta. <laughs> Next up is Glen Avon Elementary, and we congratulate Beth Vandenberg. That's not enough just to embarrass you a little bit. 
Jeff also has raised a number of foster kids, including two of my son's best friends, one of now who's, I think, doing missionary work in Africa and the other studying to be a minister. So she has just incredible energy, and she's at the gym twice as much as I am. <laughs> Rana Hill is proud to announce Ms. Heather Schaefer.
to our Indian Hills Library. As a colleague, Claudia is a true professional who is generous with her time and ideas and is encouraging to her colleagues. Even as she prepares to retire, well, I didn't notice that when I was reading all of uh, Claudia is planning for the future for her team by leaving materials and support online. Positive and upbeat with a delightful sense of humor, talking with Claudia is sure to leave you with a smile. We are all smiles and we truly are as we honor Claudia as our 2013 Teacher of the Year. Congratulations.
From Kenley Elementary School, we recognize Andy Elliott.
She uses so many modalities in her teaching. I'm really using academic language in these this descriptions, aren't we? Heather is a valuable member of the leadership team providing insightful comments and suggestions for the betterment of the school. She forgoes her personal kindergarten prep time to help run intervention programs for first graders. Her strategies have helped these at-risk students make significant progress. The students, parents, and staff love having Heather at Sky Country. Congratulations, Heather.
Van Buren Elementary, Monica Balbuena de la Sancha. Nominate 
Linda San Sanchez as our 2013 Teacher of the Year. Like you 
reserve a couple for days a year. <laughs> I'll give you a couple. <laughs> Patriot High School is proud to name Shane Tavey as our Teacher of the Year. Shane teaches his government and world history classes with a keen understanding of the students and how to motivate and engage them in their studies through debates, role playing, and current events. Walk into his room and you can feel the energy, the caring, and the love of history. He sponsors the Pop Cultures Club, helps tutor any student, even those not in this class, and has dedicated hundreds of hours this year to coaching Patriots mock trial team. Is this the first one? It's been a long time. Congratulations. He is an instructional leader, having served as a data team leader and working with others to develop interactive and effective lessons. Shane is an inspiration for all who know him and students and staff alike. Congratulations, Shane.
Look forward with anticipation to the potlucks that Ladere organizes before winter break and Cinco de Mayo. We are truly grateful to have Ladere as a part of the Nueva Vista Aztec team. Congratulations. So thank you, and I accept it in that vein. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, I know at times at the Learning Center we have some uh, challenging students there, but uh, I've enjoyed uh, working with the, with the students there and the staff. Uh, I think four, four of my last principals are here. I just came, Mr. Lewis, thank you, Mr. West, and Mr. Hampton, and Mr. Malia. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> He said, Miss Mack would never let us do this. <laughs> and I am telling you, I am amazed on my, not at what my kids do, but what they were able to learn despite their own personal problems and issues and the terrible, at least one parent that they had. But um, having watched the quality of education my own kids received, I am, I, I just get so angry when people disrespect, I'm not even going to use the slang word, public education in any way, because I won't match our education in this district to any education anywhere in the world. So congratulations. Um, Board President Schmidt, would you like to say a word? Another outstanding teacher, by the way. I'd like to congratulate all of the teachers, not only those of you that are here, but every teacher in this district is very important. And you all do a great job for all of our kids. And to celebrate all of your accomplishments, we'll take about a 10 minute break so that everyone can congratulate you. Thank you. All right, we are on to items. We'll reconvene and go we'll move on to item C. Recognize the Mock Trial team from Haruka Valley High School and Patriot High School. Rights Foundation in conjunction with RCOE, the Riverside County Bar, and the Riverside Superior Court sponsors a mock trial competition in Riverside County each year. This year, students um, argued People versus Vega, a case involving a hit and run accident. Teams from both Harupa Valley and Patriot High School participated in four rounds held in February. And if I could have the students from, well, let's see, we'll start with Harupa Valley stand, please. Coach Ms. McCardle, the following students participate. I'd like to congratulate Perla Alberto, Manuel Delgadillo, Jessica Magana, Alejandra Rosso, Ricardo Renteria, and these next students were also nominated for Blue Ribbon Awards Arlene Alonso, Cheyenne Hamilton, Jasmine Jacobo, Rebecca Jimenez, Caitlin McCardle, Alan Navarro, Semporion Fong, Lizbeth Rivera Hernandez, Rogelio Rodarte, Cheyenne Strong, and Jesse Torres. Congratulations. And I said the Patriot students could stand. coaches Shane Payne and Judy Tombach, as well as attorney coach Mr. Underwood. We'd like to congratulate Robin Cabrera, Pierce Ford, Alyssa Gallimore, Bowen Lynn, Melissa Lopez, Daniel Ortiz, Diego Ortiz, Fernando Ortiz, Michelle Ortiz, <laughs> Rachel Red, Perla Sanchez, Alejandra Vasquez, and Margarita Villalba. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Dabrowski, and congratulations to all the students from Harupa and Patriot. And thank you for letting us see your faces tonight here at the meeting. Next, we'll move on to public verbal comments. 
and public speakers have a right to their own opinions and neither board members nor staff will be responding to these opinions. The district silence should not be mistaken for agreement, but simply to avoid legal entanglements and or to protect the privacy of situations that may involve lawsuits, employee discipline, or dismissal. Please be assured any serious allegations have been or will be investigated thoroughly and any responses from the board will take place during board member comments. And each speaker will have three minutes this evening to talk. Since we do not have um, our regular light system, I will set my phone for two minutes and it will beep and then set it again for one minute so that you have a warning. And I have Mr. Martinez, but I have two separate addresses. Well, I have one for 43rd Street and one for Ridgewood. Okay, and you may come up and speak, please. I've got my phone. Oh, okay, perfect. I didn't know it was there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Do I face this way? Do I face that way? Over here, it, it should have gotten turned around. If you could turn it around, I would appreciate it. And up here will be the time for the three minutes. quick. All right. Whatever. My name is Justin Martinez. I'm with an organization called Need Help. I've been working about three months to try and assist the school board uh, since the Sandy Hook shooting in 12-14-12. I'm going to start. Good God, sorry. All right. I'm going to start with something I wrote my daughter's. If you have something to say, say it tomorrow, be, maybe too late. I've spoken to pretty much all the board members up there. You guys get to meet me now, because I was told that you've never seen my face, you don't know me. Um, we've asked you to consider issues with security and safety at schools. Uh, you told us you guys have a budget to consider. Uh, we don't believe you're doing a job, especially Paul Gale. I'm not holding any punches here. Um, we believe that the kids' safety and security is at risk. I don't think that Paul Gill is qualified to make the assessments, and I don't believe that your board has made the correct assessments in the security and safety interests of the children or the teachers. We believe you're failing. But then I was looking at your agenda here, your estimated reserve, unrestricted access, <coughs> in excess of $4,768,606. And it really leads me to question whether or not you guys are taking the issue of security and safety seriously. So we're in an active state of protest at this point. We're in direct communication with the Sheriff's Department, the City of Rupa Valley, they're very familiar with us and how we do things. Um, basically, you have no provisions in order at the schools that we've seen to detect, deter, observe, or report. We've come up to your principals and we've asked them to make their issues clear here and they've told us the exact same thing, that they just don't have the resources. And then as a board, I've called you guys on the phone over the past couple weeks and you've confirmed that the budget is in fact an issue of concern. I can tell you as a parent that's unacceptable. As an organization, we've already presented a business plan to assist you in this, which you've refused. So at this point, we're going to hit the streets and ask the people anyways, we'll just do it without your approval. In fact, we might even have more success because the people I've talked to so far, even teachers within this district, don't believe they're safe. So I don't know what else you guys are talking about tonight. This is the only time I'm coming to address the board on this unless you call me back. Otherwise, you'll see me on the street. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Next, we'll move on to administrative reports and written communications. 
and accept the initial bargaining proposal from CSEA 392. Mrs. Elvis. Thank you. The district is in receipt of the initial contract reopener proposal from CSEA, and it's recommended that the board receive the proposal at this time without comment. The, then the uh, proposal will be publicized now in order to um, allow public verbal comments at the next regularly scheduled board meeting. Thank you. And next we'll review the tentative schedule for the 2012-13 awards and graduation ceremonies. And before I have Mr. Dabrowski go through that, um, board members, if before you leave tonight, I need you to sign up for what graduations you'll be receiving students at. And Mr. Dabrowski. Thank you. You can see the, uh, the schedules published there, the, the high school awards, middle school awards, as well as the high school graduations. Thank you. And next is the report on transition to Common Core State Standards, Mr. Dabrowski. Thank you. Uh, as you know, this is a, a, a very big part of our work in Ed Services uh, now and over the next several years. And so what I propose to do is to um, keep this as sort of a, a returning item each time and give you a, a small piece of information about our transition to Common Core. Tonight I'm going to talk specifically about changes to middle school math pathways. And you have a handout, but don't look at it yet. I'll give you a little background first. Um, as, as you're probably aware, in, in our state for several years, the, uh, the position has been that eighth grade students are to take algebra. And our state went so far as to penalize schools for any student in eighth grade that was not taking an algebra test at the end of the year. They would automatically drop their score, one proficiency band. So if a student tested proficient on any test other than algebra, they could only get a basic. And then at ninth grade, that penalty was doubled. So in ninth grade, a student who was not taking an algebra test would have their proficiency score dropped two proficiency bands. So a student who scored proficient would score below basic. So for a long time, that's been a, it's been a very, um, stringent requirement of policy in our state, and we've been somewhat in the minority among states in the country. Um, moving up towards the, the uh, Common Core Standards, the Common Core Standards were written with the idea that students would take algebra in ninth grade. When California originally adopted the, com adopted the Common Core Standards in 2010, they did it in sort of a unique way. They added to the Common Core Standards an eighth grade algebra pathway and added additional standards at the lower grade levels to prepare students for that eighth grade algebra. Um, and, and I think we were the only state to do that. More recently, the state has reversed course and has adopted the position of the intent of the Common Core writers, which is that algebra one is the grade level ninth grade course. So we're, um, in our transition to Common Core, we're looking at the impact of those things and making some modifications to our, um, to our course offerings over the next few years. And we're relying heavily on the Secondary Math Program Committee, which is a group of 17 expert secondary math teachers and two principals and our director of secondary ed, Jay Trujillo, to really look at what the intent is with the Common Core, what the key concepts are in instruction, and what the appropriate pathways are. So now you can take a look at your path. Okay. This first page, entitled Current Middle School Pathway, this sort of details what's been our status quo for several years. Meaning, um, if you look on the left, you have seventh grade, on the right, you have eighth grade. And that top row would be our accelerated path students. And those are our students who are the top half of the advanced scoring students on the CST in sixth grade. And they would typically skip seventh grade math, take algebra one in seventh grade, then take geometry in eighth grade, and then, um, should they be successful enough, continue on to algebra two in ninth grade. Now obviously that creates some gaps because they have no exposure whatsoever to our seventh grade standards, which was a problem for our 97 California standards, but will be a much bigger problem for Common Core standards. 
Um, going down to the next set, our grade level pathway, that's the path that most of our students would take, and that would be to take seventh grade pre-algebra, and then move on to algebra one in eighth grade, and then move to geometry in ninth grade. And then our intervention pathway, that would be the pathway that our most struggling students would take. And there have been two options. More traditionally, there would be seventh grade pre-algebra with additional support, perhaps a second period of support for math. But more recently, we've developed and are piloting our foundations course, which is a skills remediation course to really get at the, the deficits that those students have and prepare them to be successful in algebra a few years down the road, rather than push them ahead into courses that they're not prepared for. And then moving on to eighth grade, they would take either eighth grade pre-algebra or foundations depending on their scores and their continued need for remediation. So that's what we have now. The next page is what we will have the year after next when we are fully implementing the Common Core Standards at the secondary math level. And so the way it will look is for our accelerated students, what the, what the writers of the Common Core propose is that rather than skip a grade and not have access to those standards, they take the seventh grade standards, the eighth grade standards, and Algebra 1, which would be three years worth of courses, and they compact it into two years. So students in seventh grade would be taking what we would call Accelerated Math 7, which would be all of the Common Core seventh grade standards as well as a portion of the Common Core eighth grade standards. Then they would move on into eighth grade. They would take the remainder of the eighth grade standards as well as Algebra 1. And so by the end of eighth grade, they would have finished the seventh grade, eighth grade standards as well as Algebra 1. Now for our at grade level, the, the vast majority of our students, and, and when we talk about the accelerated pathway, it would be on average about one class or one section of 30 students at each of our middle schools. These are our, our very highest students. Although we believe when we've instituted this pathway, we'll be able to widen that group a little bit. The grade level pathway for the majority of our students, they would take Math 7, which would be the Common Core 7th grade math standards, and then Math 8, which would be the Common Core 8th grade math standards, and then would be prepared for Algebra 1 in ninth and then our intervention pathway students, our students who have the greatest struggle, would take our foundations course in seventh grade and then could continue in their foundations course depending on their demonstrated need at the end of seventh grade year. Or if they've achieved at a high enough level, they would move on to math eight with support, meaning they may have two periods of math where they will be teaching the math eight content but supporting them with a second period as well. So that's sort of the picture of what it will look like the year after next. If you turn to the last page, this is our transition year. Next year is kind of a, a, a messy year because we're sort of on our way to being fully implemented with Common Core, but we're not all the way there yet. So this, you can see, doesn't have any arrows because this is a one-year snapshot of what courses we'll be using next year. So for our accelerated math seven, those will be students coming out of sixth grade now, they'll take accelerated math seven, which will be the seventh grade common core standards as well as part of eighth grade. For our eighth grade accelerated students, those are students who right now are in our seventh grade algebra classes. So they're in seventh grade, they're taking algebra, and the problem is they're missing the seventh grade standards and they're missing standards that they will need to be prepared for Algebra 2, Geometry, Success in Common Core level courses, because those courses are going to be more rigorous and more conceptual than the courses we have now. So those students will take what we call Accelerated Math 8. It will include some accelerated, some 7th and 8th grade math standards, some Algebra 1 standards that are not currently part of our standards, and some Geometry and Statistics and Probability, all of which have not been part of our curriculum until now, but they will require to be successful in the Common Core classes. Going down to the next set, our, uh, the vast majority of our students, they will take Math 7 as seventh graders, and those students that are in pre-algebra now as seventh graders will take Math 8, and then the intervention pathway. 
is, is much the same as it will be um, the year after. So that's a lot of information. Um, definitely some changes. We're really excited about the Common Core implementation, in particular, the way it's going to prepare our students for math success. All of the elementary Common Core math standards are directly aimed at getting students successful when they get up here. And that's gonna be a really wonderful thing. So this is just sort of an FYI to sort of give you an idea of some of the changes that are happening over time. Uh, any questions about those middle school math pathways? No? Yes, um, the chart where that's on second page for the 2014-15 uh, school year. Yes. Um, what would be the criteria for identifying uh, the students that would be placed in the class? You mentioned it would be only one class so at the accelerated pathway. Our current criteria for identifying students is the top half of our students that score at the advanced level on CSTs as well as teacher recommendation. Our belief is that we will be able to widen that to the entire class of students who are scoring at the advanced level. Now, of course, that's looking at CST scores, which we will have this year and next. So that this, this will change in terms of the criteria for entering accelerated pathways when we have a different test. But right now, it would be uh, advanced on the CST, fifth and sixth grade, as well as teacher recommendation which is what you have in place now for getting them into um, Algebra 1. I'm sorry, say that again? Uh, that's the criteria that you have right now for getting them into Algebra 1 in seventh grade right now? That's actually twice as wide as what we have now because okay. right now we're taking the top half of advanced okay. and our intent with the next pathway would be to take all of the advanced. So it would be widening it out to the entire group of advanced students. Okay. And uh, the, last, the bottom section, the intervention pathway, you had mentioned that you anticipate one class at the accelerated level. Um, what would be the number of classes you would anticipate at the intervention pathway level? I can get that information for you. I don't, I don't currently have that. Um, we've developed this class with the help of the Secondary Math Program Committee and are piloting it at two of our middle schools and a high school. So it's in its first year right now, and we really plan to kind of look at that at the end of the year, see the success look at the students that entered that class in the pilot, where they started out, and how successful that was for them, and then make that determination. But essentially, you'd be looking at your below basic or far below basic student in that. Um, but that's a really a, a rough idea until we really narrow it down and look at how students did this year. Uh, one last question on the last page uh, for the 2013-2014 uh, year. Um, what well, we're looking here then basically is sort of a hybrid for the first year, in essence, uh, uh, the first full year of implementation to sort of bridge the transition from one system to the other. Absolutely. Okay. For example, that accelerated math eight, that's a one year course. It'll never be taught again because it's really to go back and fill in the gaps with the 97 standards in anticipation of future success with the common core standards. So then the following year, it will be straight, midline, <coughs> common core standards because the students will have had them the year before. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, after the implementation of all the new standards, will students still have the option of taking Algebra 1 in 7th grade? <coughs> they will not. Okay, so then... And, and the reason for that is because, you know, right now when students skip over 7th grade, um, they miss a certain level of standards that the Algebra 2 teachers tell us they have to spend some time remediating. Mm -hmm. But with the fullness of the Common Core seventh grade standards, it would be dramatic, the things that they would miss, because both seventh and eighth grade become much more rigorous. I just found like, uh, in my own math experience that Algebra 2, they spent almost a whole first semester reviewing concepts from Algebra 1. So I think that it might be harmful to our kids to get even further behind in a competitive field for college and math, even if you are filling in some standards that way. Well, and I, and I don't think there will be a competitive issue because 47 of our states have adopted the Common Core, mm -hmm. and so uh, I would anticipate that 47 states would be having the same math pathways, and the accelerated track, track would include Algebra 1 in eighth grade and Geometry in ninth. So, I would look to see a lot of states 
having that, that same interaction because it's not, there is no geometry course for middle school. So there wouldn't be that option for students. But there is current. But there is current. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for that report, Mr. Dabrowski. Next, we'll move on to the report on the district pesticide use. Mr. Gill. Yes, ma'am. This is an annual report we put together that's in your backup documents. Uh, once again, at the direction of the board and the administration, we're very careful and try to reduce as much as possible the amount of pesticides we use. If uh, you have any questions on the report, Mr. Gill tells it is here to answer those questions. Thank Anyone you. with questions? All right. Thank you. And next, we will move. Or are there any other administrative reports on written communications? Thank you. Next, we'll move on to the approved routine action items by consent, items A, 1 through 15. Move for approval. Second. I have a motion by Mrs. Burns and a second by Mr. Schaefer. All the students. I see one hand. <laughs> you can either say yes or hand. Either way is fine. All right, forward. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Item B, Certified 2012-13 Second Interim Financial Report. Mr. Gill, I believe this is where you'd like us to move. Yes, ma'am, if, if you could, please. It's, there's a number of slides to show, and you'll probably uh, be best served by seeing them down below in the seats. And we'll drop the slide check. Right. So at the request of some board members that went to the Marina Valley Auditorium about uh, six weeks ago or two months ago, um, you were very impressed with what you saw and thought that was important information and wanted to get information to other board members and the public that wished us to see it. So what I wanted to do was show you selected slides from those briefings because those briefings put together probably took a lot more than an hour but we show you the slides that would be most appropriate, I think, for California and for Arupa Valley schools. And then we would conclude, and then I'll show you um, the multi-year projection as we now have it for the second interim report. And then we'll show you a slide that you've seen a number of times before, our ending fund balance and where that is today. Okay? So. This was the uh, professor at UCLA and what his themes were are that the United States is muddling through a very small growth period. The recession was the greatest since World War II or before World War II, the Great Depression actually. And this is one of the most modest recoveries after a deep recession in the history of the United States. And then he talked a little bit about monetary and fiscal policy and then California and Riverside County, which is mainly what you'll see here. This is gross domestic product growth remains sluggish. Um, and this is a percent change. That SAR means uh, the seasonally adjusted annual rate, if you were interested in that. You can see that in 08, as everybody knew, we were in the depths of the recession and we've been gradually coming out of it. We've been coming out of it to a very small degree. So you see we're getting some growth here, but the GDP growth is only at about 4% right now. 
And this is the employment gain across the state of California. Here's the U.S. by comparison, and here's various areas, the regional areas across California. And over here is the Inland Empire. So our employment gain is hovering, that's just, uh, this says 1%, 1%. This is their slide. I think what they meant was 1.5% right here. So our growth for 2012 has been about 1.5% for employment. And a big thing that drives the economy in the local area is housing permits. And here's what we're seeing over the course of the years. You see at the depths of the recession dropped all the way down for multifamily, very low in 2010. We actually have been just peaking along, moving along here. You see an uptrend in 2012 and a little bit of a downdraft. One thing that I want to point out that I don't have on any slides, um, I've been meeting over the course of the last two months with a number of developers out on the west end of the city where they're looking at putting in a, a, about 1,700 single family homes. So that should serve our area well. And this is California's home sales over the course of the last five years. So we think even though there's a little bit of a downtrend here, the general trend in 2012 has been moving up. And where we say strength turns to weakness, uh, Riverside County for years has led on construction employment being one of the main drivers of the economy. And you see that construction employment actually peaked all the way back in 06 and 07. And the manufacturing employment in terms of thousands of job, jobs peaked around 08 and it's flattened out and maybe moving just up a hair. This data only goes to 2011. So there's a tremendous number of jobs that are generated by construction and by manufacturing and, and nothing much is happening there. And this is the California forecast as UCLA sees it. So payroll employment is just very slightly moving down here and then moving back up in the next year. And unemployment gradually falls over the next two years. They're forecasting a drop of about 2% and personal income is going to rise. This is a healthy rise in 2014, but 12 being at 1.2 and 1.8 is fairly modest. So, and this is what the uh, UCLA folks say, the consequences of Prop 13. It's an opportunity to eliminate wide swings in revenue, but that only, most of that is temporary, as you know. So, on a temporary basis for the next five to six years, um, we, should be, we should be modest in the swings that we've experienced. But there still are risks, and a lot of it, you'll see, depends upon personal taxes that are generated. And, they can vary greatly. The interesting thing that I found here, the average time to see between recessions is five and a half years, and we've just hit that this year. And the longest we've ever gone between the start of one recession and the start of another is 10 and a half years, and that's coming up in the next five years. So we've got some uh, near-term fixes, but we don't have the long-term tax reform that UCLA feels as though, and so many other people think that we need. Now this, I'm switching into uh, Ron Bennett's, uh, the CEO of School Services, and here's some slides that he presented in Marina Valley that night. And this is, uh, this is more localized, everything here is centered on California. So the nice thing is, for the first time in five years, there's no cuts that we should experience, and there aren't even any threatened and we have options and opportunities. Um, slightly higher funding, this is important, it drives expectations to an unrealistic people. There are an awful lot of people out in the community and there's probably an awful lot of people in the workforce that thinks we're fixed now because Prop 30 passed. It's a wonderful thing that Prop 30 passed. It saved us from horrendous cuts, but we had that money, it just kept that money intact. Um, so we've proven that we can survive the Great Recession, but can we thrive? We have a lot of challenges, and it says, will our students uh, learn to be dependent on others, 
or will we choose to teach them to fish and make them independent rather than giving them a fish for a day? So the LAO and the Legislative Analyst Office is usually very conservative. It's a nice thing that they're relatively robust in their outlook for this year, and for the most part, they've applauded the governor's budget. Um, they're forecasting that Prop 19, 98 guarantee is going to grow between 3.4 and 5.3. Um, a lot of forecasts are overly optimistic, but the LAO is usually not optimistic, usually conservative. But there always are manipulations with Prop 98 money, so that still could have some problems for us. And the governor's dealing with a wall of debt, which is absolutely terrific. Our war years, um, that's a, a very important point. And for those of you like me who may have been educated somewhere else, in my case it was Pennsylvania, when we looked at California when I was growing up, it was not only the land of golden opportunity for economics, but it was a land of golden opportunity for education. It was considered to set the standards for the United States. And the question is, how, how far do we have to go? We have a long way to go to recapture that reputation, especially when we're still being funded about 47th or so in the United States of all 50 states. So this is something that's very important that the governor proposed this year, the LCFF, that's the Local Control Funding Formula. And this is pretty similar to a formula he proposed last year, the Weighted Student Average Formula. And we would, if this goes into effect, we in Haruka would benefit from this and we could benefit significantly. The problem is other districts see that too and they don't like the idea that some districts, districts that have a high concentration of free and reduced lunch folks and a high concentration of English learners, that we would be getting more money than people that don't have those challenges. And, that, and that's an issue with some folks right now. So let me just see if so what we have right here, the funded, the BRL is the base revenue limit. And when you add in all the categorical money, the average district would be getting $7,220 per child. There is a gap, and if I can get that. This is where we should be, but obviously we've been operating 20 and 22% below where we should be because of the deficits that we've incurred. So what the governor's proposing to do is continue to increase the base and depending upon where you are in concentration of English language learners and in concentration of free and reduced lunch students, you would be collapsing some of those categorical monies and putting it into this new funding formula. So this is where you'd be an average of, uh, by the time you got to 2021, You'd gradually be stepping up both the base limit to $6,700, and then you'd be getting the supplements, which would replace and increase some of what was categorical money, and you'd come out to $9,000 per child on the average. We would stand to gain a significant amount if this was approved. Um, right now, the LCFF is going through legislative hearings and we don't know where that's going to be. Hopefully we'll have a better idea in May, but right now we just don't know what's going to happen in this funding formula. There are a lot of people because they see them, they see this formula as a formula for winners and losers. And if they see themselves on the losing side, they don't want to have anything to do with it. Most of the districts in Riverside County would be construed as winners. There would be a few districts down in um, our South County, for example, that would see themselves as losers. So the funding, if we do get the funding, of course that leads to higher expectations, but the one thing to remember that the funding right now is about 12% less than what we received six years ago, which is really significant. And COLAs haven't been paid since 2007, 2008, Although we plugged in a COLA this year and each of the out years, um, and we're planning on budgeting with those COLAs. This year, the COLA is 1.65%. But there is going to be a strong pent up demand 
The bargaining units, our teachers, our classified staff, our managers have been sacrificing for years and everybody's going to want to try to put down and to get back to what our salary schedule used to be and go upon that. And we understand that. But we're at the beginning of a turnaround, not at the end, and we'll do what we can with what we have. So now is the time to begin the long climb back. Um, the economy is a factor. It's very slowly improving. Policy decisions, uh, Ron Bennett advises, need to be focused on the longer term. And Prop 30, it provides a short window for long-term action, remembering that Prop 30 only goes so far. And um, school service, and I believe probably all of you, and certainly our administration, believes that we have to focus on restoring our educated workforce, and we have to be more business-friendly as well. And job creation has to be a big priority if we're gonna grow the economy. We can't accept permanently poor citizens who never recover from the recession. And the way to start rebuilding is to start with public education. So there's one of the things he wants to do, and you've heard a little bit about this, I believe, but the governor wants to take it all to education, and basically, it will give us the money that we have right now, and we have a number of teachers assigned, but none permanently that only do it all to education. They do that um, as, as extra work and are compensated as such. He wants to take adult education and move it to community colleges. And there's the thought that the community colleges would be contracting with the districts and we would still continue to provide that. There's a lot of work that needs to be done here and a lot of things that we need to sort out. So this is just the beginning of the story. Risk of the budget, um, the state and national growth aren't certain by any means. This is something that is really significant, I think, the second bullet. California with tax revenues, 60% of it comes from personal income tax. And when you have something like a, uh, a Facebook going public and people make tens and hundreds of million dollars and they pay those taxes, that's terrific. But without the Facebooks or if you have Apple, their stock is going down now for the last few months where it has been one of the uh, the largest companies in the United States, so much is dependent upon so few people. And rising health care costs, we're dealing with that right now. The health care costs that came in for us this year for all of our employees is going to equate to almost 9% increase over it was last year. And we still have a lot of borrowing that's taken place, although the governor's proposal to take a lot of that new money from Prop 30 and pay down that wall of debt gradually most everyone applauds that idea because then we do generate new money. And the governor's budget proposals mark the beginning, not the end. So here's where we are. The houses of the legislature are now looking at the policy implications of the governor's plan and are going to be hearing reasons for support or resistance to the proposal. And most of that resistance is going to come from the districts that think they're not getting their fair share, and we are. So the May revision is going to be different, but we don't know if it's going to be better or worse. We may not have an absolutely clear picture during the May revision because it all depends on how quickly the legislature acts with this proposal. And that's that slide thing, and now we're going to look. And Mike, can you flip up the other, uh, the other slides, please? Anybody up there? He's working. There we go. This is hard to see. I, I apologize for that. I don't think we can make it any bigger on the screen. But this is something you've seen a number of, of times per year. And I just wanted to go through a couple of, um, two slides on this. Thank you. Okay. These are the these are the two slides that show what our multi-year projections are. I've highlighted the important, what I think are the important things in yellow, and I just want to walk you through those, those yellows, if I could. And mine doesn't have yellows, so you're going to have to forgive me. One is the, uh, is the revenue slides right there. So, 
revenue slides right here, and you can see our revenue here from all federal and state money, it's relatively flat. Now you wonder if we plugged in coal, where are the coal increases? Well, the fact is we have to plug in declining enrollment as well. So what we make up in cost of living increases, we lose in students. This year we lost a total of about 300 students. Um, we'll carry that into next year because they fund us, when you're in declining enrollment, you might recall, they fund us according to the higher of next year's enrollment or last year's enrollment. So we're still in good shape where we'll get, we, we predict declining enrollment predicted for the following year, but we're hoping that enrollment as the housing starts to grow, um, we're going to uh, stabilize our enrollment. Our total expenses over here remain relatively flat. Here's a big number here though that shows basically because of the difference between the revenue and expenses, we have an ongoing about $7 million deficit that we spend each year. We've been making up for that. This is 12, 13, 13, 14, 14, 15. We've, we've been able to take care of that because we have an ending fund balance, which continues to drop. And I'll show you that on the next page. Um, the, the components of the ending fund balance, when we get here, you can see this ending fund balance for 12-13, which went in a couple months, it looks like it's almost $20 million here. And guess what? It drops by $7 million the next year. It drops by $7 million because we're using it for that deficit factor there. And then it drops to $4 million here, 4.2. Now, our reserves, the 3% that we're required to have set aside for our expenses totals more than that. And this is what we call the combined multi-year projection. We also break down, we have an unrestricted and a restricted, but we just wanted to show you the combined, we usually deal with that. Um, so we are short about 5.3, I think that number is, in this next year. We're okay, the, the, um, next year 13-14, it's about $2.2 million that we have above our reserves after all of our restricted accounts are taken care of. It's the following year that we have a problem. But hopefully, the LCFF will come riding to the rescue. Mike, can I have the one more slide, the final slide that shows it? Okay. One number here. That's okay. I think we can see that, Mike. That's all right. Thank you. So you can see over the course of the years, we have a $25 million ending fund balance. Remembering some of this included restricted money as well. And, and just to refresh your memory, and forgive me if I bore you because you've heard this a number of times already, but the numbers up here are federal monies that we used to get, stimulus money, that we got in these three years. The numbers in the bubbles right here are the amount all of our employees gave up, what they sacrificed in furlough days, and also what was cut in programs. So the last, uh, the last stimulus dollar ended in 11-12 with the Ed's jobs money, and the last thing we've negotiated and for furlough days ends this year. So the ending fund balance projects to drop down to $12 million, Remembering that includes all restricted money and it includes the reserves as well. And then here, this 5.3 is incorrect. I'm sorry about that. I just noticed it up earlier today. This is the amount we're short from what we need. It's actually about a $4 million. If you go back and look at your multi-year projections, you'll see that the ending fund balance is a little bit over $4 million, not a negative 5.3. But a 5.3, in order to meet our reserves, in order to meet all our legal restricted monies that we have in there, it's 5.3 million short for that year. With zero concessions at all, nothing else happening. So basically, I, I want to give you a recommendation and I want to get it correct when I do that, okay? So administration recommends that the board certify that the district will be able to meet its financial obligations 
for 2012-13 and 2013-14 and resolve to take action on any budget cuts that are necessary to balance the budget for 2014 and 15. Because of the state's fiscal crisis, and this is really because of the lack of state funding thus far, administration further recommends that the board self-certify the district's report as qualified and the second interim report is qualified. And this is, uh, this is something we've done before for the last couple of years because we still have that deficit. That's why we make that recommendation. So would you want to go back up there and then you can ask questions if you want or make, take action. You drop, Mrs. Schmidt, you drop something, your hearing or something. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I do actually. I'm too focused on this budget thing here. <laughs> All right, so we are on page 15 down at the bottom with the recommendation for number one, the sixth paragraph. Thank you, I'll move for approval that we certify the district will be able to meet its financial obligations for 2012-13 and 13-14 and resolve to take action on any budget cuts that are necessary to balance the budget because of the state's physical crisis you know, uh, uh, so that we self-certify the district's um, second interim. Second interim. Thank, you. Thank you. Do I have a second? I have a second and uh, a Mr. Mendes, comment or clarification, questions? yes. Yeah. Um, on the page, uh, the set of slides with uh, Riverside County Office of Education, you outlook. Um, yes, sir. The, the page with the, um, where are these? With the graph chart with full, let's see, it's, it's titled uh, Inland County Strength Turns to Weakness. Yes. Can you give me the page number on the bottom? Uh, of the yes, page seven. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what struck me at the presentation, and correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the reasons that we're having an even more difficult uh, situation than maybe some other parts of the state is that looking at uh, the dependency that we have to drive our economy here locally is the construction industry. Um, and being that that's one of the last ones to lag behind in terms of recovery, uh, coupled with the fact that jobs uh, now are, uh, that are attracting workforce are, uh, is a workforce that's highly skilled in the, not in the construction areas or in the manufacturing field as we used to have traditionally in the past, but in the high tech and information age types of uh, employments. And given that, some of the biggest uh, areas, according to what I've been reading in terms of uh, growth, are the Bayside and um, the uh, Silicon Valley, Orange Counties, parts of the state that have those types of uh, industries or those types of businesses that attract that type of uh, work, workers, workforce. And so what struck me is that with that, we're going to see a lot slower growth in our area, meaning, for example, that uh, I think you mentioned that there were 300 students that were less in our enrollment for the past year. That this trend, if it's not, even if it doesn't continue, it's going to take an awful long time for us to uh, increase our enrollment to what we had in prior years. And that combined with several other factors is going to continue to put, I think, the Inland Empire, not just you know our district and so forth, but just the entire region in a much more difficult situation maybe than some other parts of the state. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Simply put, yes, sir. And so given that, um, the funding formula that the government is proposing it would benefit our district because given the fact that we also have, well, that would generate then the higher number of low socioeconomic you know, students numbers in our district. 
and uh, that combined with our large English learner population, we would definitely stand to benefit from, uh, from funding of that nature if, we, if that were to be uh, approved by the legislature and the governor. Correct? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. And, and, and one thing you should know, that I'm going to, I'm not, as, as you know now, I'm living in four months, but uh, one of the uh, biggest advocates in trying to push this against all odds sometimes as our own superintendent up in Sacramento with this. Many people as he can talk to about this and say this is the right thing to do. And he's not caving in on it. It's, it, it, it's something that philosophically Governor Brown believes is the right thing to do, to help people that need help the most. But Mr. Sean has been very articulate in that in Sacramento. And any of us that have been in the classroom, um, we recognize that uh, it does present greater challenges uh, to us educators, no matter where we are, uh, having to deal with students that have, that arrive in our classrooms, not anywhere near, near as well prepared as students in higher economic areas, let's say, where they had a uh, much stronger foundation before they even show up at school. Uh, not to mention, again, the English learners that have to acquire a second language before they can, you know, actually mm -hmm. uh, use their second language to uh, move ahead academically. Mr. Hernandez? Yes, thank you, Madam President. Mr. Gill, yes. uh, what uh, kind of timeline are we looking at for the, the LCFF to be implemented? Is that like at the end of this fiscal year? Or? The governor wants to start it at the beginning of this fiscal year, sir. That's his, that, that's his proposal, to do it in July. Now, there are legislatures, uh, legislators who are saying this needs to take a little more time and we need to sit through it, but the governor's not, um, I don't think he's very patient about this because he actually shipped over this weighted student formula, which was similar to the LCFF last year, and they sat on it and didn't do anything. So I think it's going to be a little bit of a fight between the governor and some of the legislators to get this through. But the governor is so adamant that he wants to have this program started this year, in July. And then also, Mr. Gill, on top of that is that when we attended that county-wide meeting, uh, they made statement of uh, developing an accountability plan because a uh, majority of the categorical were just going to be uh, lumped together and, and thrown into the general fund, in, in essence. So uh, what kind of timeline or what is our responsibility in developing an accountability plan for that? Yes, that's a great question, sir. Not much on that has come out, but there will be something here. You're absolutely correct. They're not just going to give us the money and other districts the money and say, go spend it. We're going to have to do some accounting on where that's spent. It can't just go back. They don't want to just, to, uh, they know that our employees have sacrificed, but they're, want to see, they're going to want to see programs that we put in place, people we put in place to direct the, uh, the best efforts that we have towards educating our population. And I don't know if Mr. Duchamp wants to say something about that. Yeah, the, the LCFF is included in a trailer bill, and part of that trailer bill includes the, the, what they call the LCAP, the Local Control Accountability Plan. What it says in the trailer bill, which is just in bill form now, so is, as Mr. Gill was pointing out, anything could happen to it, that the State Board of Education would develop a template for the Local Control Accountability Plan. Now the language that's in the trailer bill is very similar to the kinds of accountability that we have to do now. We would have to track budgeting to show how it would serve um, our ELs and in our um, free and reduced lunch population and probably the concentrations in the district. Um, we're watching that carefully. It's basically the kind of data we already collect. And until we see a template from the, well first of all the trailer bill has to pass, which is um, I think in the end the governor gets his way, but it may be this year or next year. And once it passes, then it would be on a timeline for the state to develop that accountability plan. Once the, uh, once the Board of Education develops it, then we would have to implement it. I doubt that we would have it um, in place for this year or this coming year, but it may be. So, so in essence, we as a board don't need to develop it. It's going to be developed by uh, state board, is that what I think saying? it will be a template, <clears throat> and it'll basically be not so much, I mean, it's not going to be simply as fill in the blanks. It's going to be, say, for example, 
how are you addressing the needs of your DLs and, and how are you using funds specifically to address those needs? Because I, I see it as uh, them setting a standard of a uh, certain percentage of the budget going to, to each uh, area of uh, that needs to be addressed. Now, technically, that's exactly what the what the governor doesn't want them to do, yeah, but, but certain legislators would like for to have that happen. Exactly. That's what I see happening. Yeah. <laughs> In real world. Any other questions, Mr. Schaefer? D you know, depending on these, uh, depending on these numbers or relying on them, it would would, would be foolish. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, job creation is our is our number one priority, and can uh, and California is so anti-business, mm -hmm. it just it shocks me. Yeah. You even have those, uh, how should I say, very wealthy individuals waking up, figuring out that they are paying 65 percent of their income in taxes. They're not going to hang around in the state too long, and these businesses continue to leave. There are businesses that are here that want to expand, but because of the regulations and taxes, they say, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, I, I have a question on uh, the adult education shift. W are we still going to provide the venue so that the uh, community colleges, will we provide the venue? Facility. Facility. That's a good question. Um, according to the governor and what he's proposed, the funding and responsibility would go to the community colleges and it would be incumbent on them to provide the service that was left behind. Now, whether they actually have a mandate to do that or not um, is unclear at this point. It's already stirred a controversy in Sacramento amongst the adult ed community, meaning adult ed teachers, and separate from the community college saying that they don't know that the community college is ready to take that on. Um, we're watching it very carefully because we have a concern locally that the classes that we're still offering, now that program could cut considerably, mm -hmm. but a major portion of our classes now are GED classes, which are picking up some of our graduates who are, or some of our non-graduates who haven't passed the cases. So, we're going to watch that very carefully. We're going to look at how that need could be met and try to make sure that, that there's not a gap. But that may not pass the legislature at this point. We may not get that funding shift, so we'll see. What was the cost of adult education to the district? Wait, it, it used to be, and I'll, I'll rely on Karen, I'm thinking the total bill was around $800,000 that we allocated, that we sweep some of that money into the unrestricted general fund. And Karen, I'm thinking we sweep uh, about half, would you say? I don't know, you know off the top of your head, less than half? We sweep 100,000 of that? Okay. So we the adult education program, because of the needs of our young citizens, is we thought it still needed, and so we kept most of that program intact, but not with full-time teachers. There is one other hook in there, and maybe not for us, but he is not really taking our funding away, but I think that would show up as part of the LCFF. So mm -hmm. in, in essence, while it may not be a responsibility, it would be something we could look at shoring up or contracting with them. But I, and, that's another one that's it's a long time between now and June. Where were we? <laughs> Mr. Hernandez. Got to put it back on. You know, I guess I get a little confused because uh, at the county meeting they, they said that it was going to be the responsibility of uh, uh, the community colleges to, to provide uh, adult education because the funding to the school was going to be reduced and cut off in several years. So if that's the case, because Mr. Deshaun, you brought up that, that uh, uh, community colleges were, are, are not mandated, in essence. And I, and I thought they were going to be mandated. And if they're not <coughs> mandated and we're not being funded, then what's going to happen to that program and to those individuals that are taking those classes? Yeah, I, 
You may be right in that they will be mandated. We haven't seen that yet. What, what I've heard, and, and I don't know, maybe Mr. Gill's heard a little bit differently, that the responsibility will shift to them. But there's no mandate even to us to offer those classes. So that they're not required classes at this point. I don't know it would be a requirement to anybody to offer the class. So it's, it's a big gap and it's a big concern. And, and the ideal situation, sir, would be a, we're supposed to get that money that we were getting for it, and this was new money that would go to the colleges. What we propose doing is to contract with the community college and educate the people ourselves because we think we've been in the business, we've got the facilities, we have the people, although they're working part-time, and that's the way to, that's the way to go with it. Some of the community college people have to get over the hurdle of the fact they think they're getting less money than we were getting. But in fact, they're not because we were using a smaller amount of money we were getting to, to provide for adult education services. So it's one of those things, it's a, it's a great question, but as Mr. Duchamp said, it's still a really big question out there. It needs to be sorted out yet. Go ahead. And, and with that, is that uh, have we started negotiating with uh, the community college? Is there a timeline that we need to be looking at to, to, to get this resolved? That way we understand which way we're going and where that program is going? I've, I've had an informal uh, short discussion with uh, Dr. Gray, uh, the chancellor of uh, RCC, and he was still, um, I'll, I'll rephrase what I was going to say. He's, uh, He's not sure exactly where he's going. He's not ready for discussions yet. <laughs> that was good. Understandable. <laughs> <laughs> he's still my heart. Any other questions? Just, just uh, let me just paper? let me just clarify one one thing. So next year, we are not going to have adult education. No, sir. That's not the case. That's not the case. No, sir. I'm, I'm missing something here. I'm no. The governor's proposal is that the responsibility will shift to community colleges. That's something that Mr. Duchon, from his dealings and knowledge of Sacramento, is saying that may not happen. We just don't know where we're going to be. If that part of the governor's proposal is approved, yes, we would not have the responsibility for adult education. But the legislature may well, that may be something that they overturn and, and negotiate the part. And if the colleges do take it over, we will still get the funding for it. We'll get the funding that we're currently getting as part of the LCFF, yes sir. Gotcha. So, between the two, with adult ed up in the air, we're not going to let those people that need those services flounder in the never, never land. No, if, no. if nothing gets fixed, we'll still continue We'll, we'll be back to you on that. We'll, as we can. Sure, I know. If it goes to RCC, then we can't do anything without RCC saying we want you to do it because at that point they're the leaders of that. There, there could still be some services that we provide for a while. I think we need to see where this goes. Right. And Mr. Jushan, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's just. There's so much that's unknown about this besides that we, I, I'd like to, we'd like to give you an exact answer, but we don't have one right now, Mrs. Schmidt. So right now, we're just in the legislator's we're, hands until we, they make we we any are. decisions. We, we're there's the nothing that we... We are, it's a huge events. question mark right now. Yes, ma'am. Let me try to alleviate your concerns a little without totally relieving them, if that makes sense. Um, <laughs> There are several major negotiating obstacles the governor has. One is the disposition of transportation funds, the disposition of what he calls target of TIC, targeted instructional improvement grants. Adult ed is another source, the LCFF itself. So what we're basing, when you look at the budget that we're presenting to you, it's based on the most conservative outlook, which means we're projecting COLA only on revenue limit, no LCFF, and um, the same funding that the sources that we're getting. Our adult ed, ed teachers are primarily teachers teaching six period assignments 
or teachers that come in if they're called what, short term temporary help, I think. Short term employees. Short term employees. So we are positioned so that we can continue that program. The worst case scenario is that we end up with no funding, the community colleges end up with no funding or limbo, then we're going to have to come back to you with some tough decisions. So try to tell it like it is as much as we know. Any other questions? All right, we have a motion and a second. Student board? <laughs> okay. I knew they were sitting up there and I didn't see it, so it came back up there. All right, so board, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Then we have the other fund summary. Yes, sir. And we recommend that the board certify that the district will be able to maintain a balanced budget in the other funds, which we will. I will move for that certification. We have a motion by Mrs. Burns. Second. A second by Me. Mr. Mendez. <clears throat> All right. Any questions on that? No. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 5 0. Item C adopt resolution number 2013 27, resolution for expenditure of excess funds. Mr. Gill. I'm sorry, I'm missing the page here. Sixteen. Yeah, I see. Rip mine out. Resolution. Resolution is on the seventh. Where the uh, staff held their view. Staff, the recommendation oh, away at the end of this. Uh, oh, they're all over. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't see it here. Karen, do you see the staff recommendation? No. Well, staff, are we? recommend that they approve it. Okay, that's what we'll do. The staff recommends that they, you adopt resolution number 2013-27, resolution for expenditure of excess funds. Sorry, I didn't uh, put that in there. This recognizes the fact that we didn't have those cuts that we had previously budgeted, which would total over $8 million in cuts. Move for approval. Second. Have a motion by Mrs. Burns, a second by Mr. Schaefer. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Item D, approve purchase of Apple IMAX for Make Haruki. a motion to approve purchase of the uh, Apple IMAX for Group of Valley High. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Schaefer, a second by Mr. Hernandez. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Item E, approve Head Start. 2013-14 area plan. Move for approval. Second. I have a motion by Mrs. Burns, a second by Mr. Schaefer. Any questions or comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Item F, approve the Head Start Summary of Findings and Correction Action Plan. Mr. Dabrowski. <coughs> Thank you. The federally funded Head Start program is at Glen Avon, Ina, Pacific Avenue, Troth, and West Riverside. This, these are the summaries of findings from their annual self-review and their action plans. We recommend that you approve the summary of findings and uh, the correction action plan. Move for approval. Second. Have a motion by Mr. Mendez, a second by Mrs. Burns. Any questions or comments? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Item G, approve Head Start readiness goals. Move for approval. Have second. a motion by Mrs. Burns, a second by Mr. Schaefer. Any questions or comments? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Item H, approval of program, of program improvement PI Revisions to the Single Plans for Student Achievement, SPSAs. Mr. Dabrowski. Thank you. We now have 11 schools in program improvement as the requirements or the, or the percentages necessary to meet have risen up to 89%. Um, as a result, the district office and RCOE have um, organized technical assistance for those schools with training and analyzing data, reviewing quality instructional methods, identifying needs and aligning funding to meet those needs. The schools then made some revisions to their single plan for school, 
single plan for student achievement. They were peer reviewed by all of our Ed Services staff. Um, they, in your supporting documents, there's an outline of the focus areas and uh, the full copies of the revised plans are available on the website. And we would recommend that you approve the uh, program improvement revisions to the single plans for student achievement. I have a motion by Mr. Mendez. Second. A second by Mr. Hernandez. Any questions or comments? All those in favor say aye. Oh, yes, Mr. Schaefer. I, I noticed on uh, most of these that uh, they're trying to get parent involvement, parent workshops, uh, coffee with the principal. Uh, are there, you know, you're the experts. What more can we do? What, what, what more can we do or, or, or to, to get uh, these parents involved? Because with parent involvement, uh, it, it really helps the, the student uh, buckle down and uh, helps them achieve their uh, goals in, in the classroom. Is there, uh, do we have anything else we can do? Uh, there's, there's a number of things that we are really trying to, this year to rebuild our PTAs, PTOs by looking for leadership to take that on. Um, I know it's been presented here, you probably saw an article in the paper about Cafe Literario, where we're really trying to work with parents just to engage them kind of in, in school-based projects, not necessarily even school, you know, they're you know, separate from the school. And I think the more we can do that, the better. We've had programs at some schools that are um, really kind of, you know, for example, you don't think of it as a typical parent involvement program, but the 100 Mile Club is starting to bring parents, kids together, and it, it's interesting because something that we started kind of, you know, to get kids involved with physical activity has now become something that teachers are using as an incentive, like, you get to walk an extra mile today, and parents are walking with the kids, and so we're, we're going to try to capitalize on, on what's happening, and we're very aware of the issue, I mean, even with the school boundaries, I think you were at both meetings, we had you know, e either people really like what we're doing or uh, it's just hard to get people out. They're busy, they're, they're working and struggling, but um, I, I wish we could say we had a, a magic, you know, a silver bullet and Dave may want to add. Yeah. Nothing other than, you know, we are attending, um, Terry Marino attends the Family Involvement Network meetings and we are looking at implementing new strategies at, at all of our schools, trying to increase that. But as you, as you mentioned, families are working, families are struggling, it's it's a difficult thing. I, you know, there was the, what was that program that they had at Van Buren and a couple other schools where the parents uh, came in uh, regularly on a weekly basis or something where uh, provided with skills and information about the school and the students went along with them. And I guess my question is, do we have any expansion of those programs or are those still in place or anything of that nature? Those are still in place. They've not been expanded. It was grant funding that we received um, but it, and it, it would be wonderful to be able to replicate those but we've, we've not been able to secure additional funding for that. Um, we, ha we have on our, the west end of our district with Mr. Campos at Trump established the West Rupa Valley Collaborative and, and looking at trying to bring outside services in um, which include things like parenting classes and, and family involvement type activities, but um, it, it's a work in progress. That, I, I think at both those schools, at one time we had a full or three-quarter time parent liaison, and that's exactly why I go screaming to all these legislative groups about why it's so important when you have high concentrations of ELs and, and free and reduced lunches that you really do need extra resources. I just wanted that in the minutes, so now when I go to Sacramento, I can tell them, read our board minutes, too. <laughs> Are you still clear of that long run? I'm not on that. I'm sure I'm going to Proud advocacy, and I pitch this everywhere I go. <laughs> All right, any other questions? All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Item I, Act on Student Discipline Cases. 
Case 13-017, we will remove from tonight's agenda, table it from tonight's agenda. So we'll move on to number two, uh, revoke expulsion case 13-023. We have a motion by Mrs. Burns and a second by Mr. Mendez. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Expulsion, suspended expulsion case, agreement and stipulation. We have one, case 13-052. A motion and a second by Mrs. Burns and Mr. Mendez. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Suspended expulsion case, agreement and stipulation. We have one, case 13-053. Mr. Mendez with Mrs. Burns seconding. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Item J, approved personnel matters, approved personnel report number 14. Mrs. Elzig. Thank you. Administration recommends approval of personnel report number 14 as printed. Move for approval. I have a motion by Mr. Mendez and a second by Mr. Hernandez. Yes. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Direct issuance of re-employment notices to regular certificated employees. Move approval. We have a motion by Mrs. Burns. Second. A second by Mr. Mendez. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Item 3, adopt 2013-2014 academic school year calendar. Move for approval. Second. I have a motion to approve for Mr. Mendez. Mr. Schaefer second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. And adopt 2013-2014 employee work year schedule. Move for approval. I have a motion by Mrs. Burns. Second. And a second by Mr. Mendez. Any questions? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Item J, approve, or we're still continuing. Item number 5, adopted a second reading, new board policy and administrative regulation 4144 personnel complaint. Move for approval. I have a motion by Mr. Hernandez, a second by Mr. Mendez. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Item K, appoint board representative committee assignments. And I just had one change on that for, I can't find it now. Budget. Oh, for budget all the way at the bottom, thank you. From myself on the budget committee to Mr. Schaefer. And then I need to appoint, all of you got a letter from me in the Friday letter a couple weeks ago regarding an ad hoc committee to look over the superintendent's evaluations. And so I would like to put myself and Mr. Hernandez, would you be interested? All right, so the two of us will be on it. I've gotten one evaluation. I gave till March 27th, but if you could get it turned in to me before then, or to Denise before then, that would be great so that Bobby and I can meet earlier than the weekend before the April 1st meeting, but we can get that done. And moving on, we have item L, board member comments and committee reports. Mrs. Burns, we'll start with you. I have none this evening, thank you. Oh, yes I do. Welcome to that new girl that's with the school. She is so great. It's going to be a lot of fun working with her. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. I'd like to congratulate all the teachers that won the awards this evening. I'd like to report out on the budget committee. We had a speaker discuss the effects of the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, on the district. And it's a really fluid situation. 
uh, the bill's being written as we speak, so uh, there's no conclusive bottom line as to what it really will cost, but it will cost us uh, a lot. Uh, Part-time employees, so we've got a lot, there, there's a lot that has to be discussed and uh, uh, dealt with. Uh, we do have a new doctor in the house. Uh, I attended a doc uh, doctoral dissertation today at Mission Middle with the principal, Jose Araos, who uh, became Dr. Arauz, and that, that is fantastic for the school district. It's a, a ceremony, it was a wonderful ceremony, and the way he uh, uh, conducted himself and, and, and uh, explained uh, his dissertation was, was wonderful. And so we have a new doctor in house, and congratulate to Dr. Arauz. Thank you. Thank you, and we will recognize him at the next meeting. Mr. Mendez. I second what Mr. Schaefer said about uh, our new doctor, Arauz. Um, I was there as well, too, and it was a very uh, informative and very impressive uh, process, and I had never been to a defensive dissertation, and uh, it was, I'm glad I went. It was a really wonderful opportunity, and congratulations are definitely in order. Um, following on the theme that we had about parent involvement, too, it really is nice to have had um, Ida Serma Guzman recognized in heading the Cafe Literario for the past uh, seven years, I believe, and uh, having grown from just a handful of students to 50 parents involved in that. Now, it's really something to take a look at and, and replicate in many other ways, we, as many ways as we can in the district to um, encourage as many of our parents to become involved in the education of their children. Um, I, uh, as uh, Mr. Sean uh, said, uh, visiting um, Luba Valley High School, I also attended um, the first day of the WASP team visiting the school for their accreditation visit and got a tour of the campus. I haven't seen the campus in quite a while and it's, uh, it looks really nice and even saw some murals that I hadn't seen before made out of stained glass that uh, were, I guess, recent additions within the last you know, couple of years. But uh, the visit will, uh, the, uh, the um, accreditation committee will be there through Wednesday. They'll be reporting out their findings uh, at, uh, on Wednesday afternoon at 2.20. Uh, and we hope that their recommendation will be, of course, a five-year, a six-year accreditation, excuse me, for the school. Um, and in terms of recognition, definitely for all of, uh, uh, in, it's in order for all our teachers of, of the year, congratulations, that is. It was gratifying to see that many of them, uh, having been teachers, that I had the privilege of having worked with them either uh, as a principal or later on as director of curriculum in a variety of committees and so forth. I even had, had one of them in classes that I taught way back in the 90s, so it's yeah, really nice to, to see that. Um, and uh, Ms. Joan Bain, I've known her for, I pretty much since the time that she came to work for the district and definitely being recognized at as a social studies teacher of the year is uh, an honor well deserved. So congratulations to them and to the students that uh, participated in the mock trial teams for both uh, Hoopa Valley and uh, Patriot High School. I don't believe we have had participation um, for some time from our district. And I know when I visited um, back, to, oh, oh, yeah, back to school a night at Hoopa Valley last year, um, they expressed an interest, the teachers at that time, two of the teachers that they wanted to uh, have that take place this year, and I'm so happy that not only Hoopa Valley um, put teams together and participated, but then also uh, Patriot High School as well too. So those are wonderful things typically that have to have happen in our district. I'm very pleased. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. I don't have too much to, to say other than to, to thank my fellow board members for putting up with my questioning and all the things I, I asked them to do. But uh, I want to thank staff, first of all, for the excellent presentations tonight, especially on the budget, and trying to educate the rest of the board that you have an opportunity to go to uh, the county meeting, which was very outstanding. Um, we had the opportunity to go to, I do believe it was at governance. Yes, that's right. And uh, learn basic things of policy and everything else, which I, I really love because I, I get involved in those kind of things. And, it was just an eye-opening to, to know that I wasn't too far off course 
was uh, the, the thing that I've learned over the years. But, uh, you know, I think it's a great tool, and I hope we continue to go and be educated because it was, it was fun. Uh, second, I want to thank uh, all the teachers in the district. And, and it's funny because as these teachers were being recognized for being outstanding, uh, I, I knew of about five or six of them personally, and one I graduated from a little high school with, Ladera Sanders. So, you know, we, we have started kicking back and started talking about that. But I think our district is blessed to have great educators, not so much teachers, but educators who strive to get our children ready for the real world. And as difficult as the world has become, they've done a fine job. Uh, other than that, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. And uh, like the mock trial, it's nice to see all of them here. It's nice to be seeing all the kids coming through and rec being able to recognize their jobs well done that they're doing. The teachers for all of their like Mr. Hernandez said, they're all winners in all our books. He said it's nice to recognize a few each year. I also want to remind you that tomorrow morning, 8.30, at the district office, we have a special board meeting, followed in the afternoon by the sexual harassment training. And if you look in, I got my CSD flyer today, and it talks a little bit about how the governance program is going to be changing, and they're going to be sending out some homework for us to do before the meeting, and each section is only going to be three and a half hours instead of seven hours, and then we'll have some homework to do as a board afterwards. So a little bit of change up there, and remind you to keep October, I believe it's either the 17th, 18th, or the 18th, 19th, whatever that Friday, Saturday, is when the next classes will be so as you're scheduling stuff for the next year that's coming up quick remember to book those to hold those dates open and with that thank you to everyone that came out tonight and we will see you on april 1st